I'm going to start our little Christmas series. Each week as we move closer to Christmas, I'll have another piece of Christmas to share with you. But the Christmas story really begins in the book of Luke in chapter 1. And in the book of Luke, in chapter 1, we have the angel Gabriel appearing. uh, And he shows up at the most peculiar time. King Herod is, is ruling and reigning. And we have... Just normal life going on, as it always has been. People hanging out. People are doing what they do. Everybody's cool. Everybody's relaxed. They're coming and going, giving him marriage. Everything's wonderful. Everything's fine. Until the angel Gabriel shows up. And begins to turn the world upside down again. Wow. Now, who is the angel of Gabriel? The angel Gabriel. It says he, he declares himself in chapter one of Luke that he's the angel that stands before God. So he's pretty awesome. He's the angel that stands before God. He's, he's, he's the big Mac Daddy angel. He is the, he's the main guy. He's, I think of him like the Hulk angel, except he's not green. Uh, he's got to be like busting out at the seams. Angel Gabriel shows up. And there's this woman who's a fossil, Elizabeth. She's a fossil. Uh, she is, she's old, and she's got a husband, Zechariah, who's really old. And we have two fossils here. These, these are like beyond senior citizen. These are like senior citizens of senior citizens. And they're ancient. And Zechariah is a priest. And they're just hanging out, doing what they do. You know, going to the temple, worshiping the Lord, and And uh, they've been praying for years and years and years and years and years and years years to have a child, but they can't have a child. It says that Elizabeth is barren. It ain't working. It just isn't working. And maybe after all these years, you would think that maybe their prayers have just been like, Oh, yeah, and that that baby when you get a chance. You know, it's not the passionate prayer they once had when they were young. It's not that, that pleading like they once probably had. And here they are going to the temple, doing what they do, hanging out like they hang out. People are giving and taking in marriage. They're going to family events. They're, they're not happy with the government that rules over them. It's politics as usual. Life goes on, and here they are in the temple again, and here is Zechariah the priest, and all of a sudden, the angel Gabriel shows up and says to him, oh, and by the way, that prayer that you two were praying all these years, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You're going to have a baby, and you're going to call him John. And this baby that they're going to have is John the Baptist. They're going to have a baby. And so Zachariah's response to the angel is, how's that going to happen? We're fossils. (sighs) But it says when the angel appeared that Zachariah was afraid, scared. Now, if you're in the temple and you've lived to be a, a thousand years old, I'd say he was up in his 70s. And you've lived this life, and it's, it's just the life that it is. It's the mundane life. It's what it is. The, the, Russian, the Romans have always been there hassling you. It, you know, you always had your same relatives, your same aunt and uncles, your same, everything's the same. You go into the temple, and all of a sudden, the Hulk shows up. You'd be scared, too. It just appears. It's like... 
And, he, and it, we want, I want to open the text up here in chapter 1, verse 13. And it says, but the angel said to Zechariah, do not be what? Afraid. You ever notice every time some holy angelic host shows up in the Bible, they always have to say, don't be afraid. Yeah. Every time I see that, I, I, I've probably said this a thousand times in church. Every time I see Don't Be Afraid, I think of that movie, The Ghost and Mr. Chicken. And I don't know if you remember that movie, but when Don Knox was at the gate and he was scared, his, you know, Don Knox has those eyes. His eyes burst out. And he was like, ah! That's what I think of every time I see Don't Be Afraid. That's what they probably looked like. And rather than having Zechariah have a heart attack and die, the angel quickly says, don't be afraid. It's, it's, it's good. You're not in trouble. Because he thought he was in trouble. So he says, don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice in his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and, and shall drink neither wine or strong drink, and he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will also be before him in the spirit and in power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wi wisdom and of, of the just, to make ready the people prepared for the Lord. Here is Zechariah, who knows the scriptures. He's a priest. He knows the scriptures. He knows what's been talked about through all the prophets about the Messiah that would one day come. And he also knows the scriptures that talk about the forerunner that would come first before the Messiah. And here's the angel Gabriel speaking to this man who is dedicated to the Lord and says to him, you're going to bear that child. You're going to bear that child. This has got to be a glorious day for them. Now, Zechariah uh, says that when he, he, he responds right after this and says, how could that be? And the reason he says, how can that be, is because he doesn't believe the angel. Or he would say, bring it on. But he doesn't say, bring it on. He says, how could that be? Meaning, he doesn't really believe the angel. And we know that for a fact because the rest of the text concerning Zechariah says that the God shut his mouth and made him mute. That's the alarm system. Oh, Ambler, who has their phone on? Raise your hand if you have your phone on. So we can see who forgot to turn their phone on. Off. Chuck, would you turn your phone off, please? So we don't have to stare at you because you ruined the whole service. Chuck knows I'm kidding with him. I love him dearly. I'm messing with him. So, Zachariah doesn't believe the Lord, and the Lord says, because you don't believe me, because you don't trust my word, I'm going to shut your mouth. And his mouth is shut. And then the rest of the story is pretty awesome, but I want to get on with the message. Really? Really? Who is that? Yeah, but somebody has their phone on. How do you know that? <laughs> Father, we just pray that you find that child, rescue that child, and bring that child home to its mother or its father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now that we know it's an Amber Alert, we can turn our phones off. The word of God is the most important thing on this planet. 
Do you know that? Do you believe that? It is the most important thing on this entire planet. It deserves the greatest of respect. That's how I feel about it. Let's give it respect. The story goes on after Zechariah, and it opens up in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, and it says this. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. In the sixth month of what? Elizabeth's pregnancy with John the Baptist. So in the sixth month, so Elizabeth is now six months pregnant, and the angel Gabriel is back in town. The angel's back in town. He's showing up again. He's got work to do. What is his work? To announce a message from God. And he shows up in the city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, before we go on, I want you to explain to you what Nazareth is. This is a town that is like, it's a hobunk town. It's like a little hillbilly town. It's a small population. Uh, it, I, I used to say it's like Bithlo, but that's a big city now. So what would it be like? Maybe, um, I don't know, a little smaller than Mims. Oak Hill, that's what it is. This is Oak Hill. And here the angel shows up in this little hillbilly town. The who, what angel? Gabriel. The biggest, baddest angel dude in all of heaven shows up in this little hokey town in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And it says in verse 27, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Shows up to this little girl, this virgin girl. And it says that the virgin's name was Mary. She's betrothed. That's an engagement that can't be broken. It's as good as marriage. It cannot be broken. It's set in concrete. She's getting married. And the, the average age for a woman of that era, of that culture, to be engaged would usually be somewhere between 15 and 17. So let's just say she's 16. Now, a 16-year-old girl in love and engaged is pretty excited, wouldn't you think? Maybe more excited than a 22-year-old. She's bubbly, giddy, happy, bouncy. And mom and all the relatives are helping plan the wedding all the neighbors are excited. I mean, in that culture, everyone's fired up over a wedding. It's a big deal. If you've ever gone to a Jewish wedding, it's a big deal. Huge. And it's kind of like a Greek wedding. Huge deal. And here is this little 16-year-old girl. I don't know if she was cute or not, but let's just say she was cute. This cute little 16-year-old girl married or in, engaged to Joseph. They're excited. They're planning their marriage. They're probably picking out where they're going to live. Probably the father is building a little extension on the house for them to move into. He has a job. He's telling all his friends at work. The invitations go out. The flowers are ordered. They've got the caterer all planned. Everything's set. The temple's reserved. And now Gabriel shows up to wreck her life. It's a mess now. Now we know the rest of the story because they wind up having to go down to Egypt, hang out down there in a country they don't really know, they don't speak the language, to hide out because we have the, the government running after them to try to kill Jesus. We know the rest of that story. But to back up and get a picture of this Mary, Mary, Gabriel shows up to Mary to announce something that's going to change her life radically. Verse 28, 
And having come in, the angel coming in to her home, showing up, the angel said to Mary, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Hmm. But when she saw him, she was troubled at, the, at his saying. 16-year-old girl engaged to be married. Probably the happiest moment of her life. Gabriel shows up and he says, Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Uh, anybody think that that might be a strange way to greet her for an angel from heaven sent down? And could you understand why she'd be saying, that's a strange greeting? Okay. That's a bizarre way to say, Hey, Mary, how are you doing today? Anyone who is close to the Lord, has a good relationship with the Lord, really seeking the Lord, searching after the Lord, they, have, they usually have a humble spirit about themselves, meaning they have a correct estimate of who they are. I'm sure that Mary knows that she's not perfect. Yes, she loves the Lord. Yes, she serves... The Bible is very clear that she's a devout woman. She loves the Lord. But I believe that anyone who is walking close to the Lord knows for certain who they are. And to have a greeting like this from the Lord, whoa, wait a second. Are you talking to me or is there someone else in the house? And she wonders, this is a, this is a strange greeting. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. He shall be called, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus. God with us. Another name for Jesus is Joshua. He says, the angel goes on to say, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. These are big words to this little Jewish girl who knows the word of God and knows who the highest is. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Now, the throne of his father, David, means it's an eternal throne, an everlasting throne. Okay, I'm going to have a baby, and my baby is going to be the son of the most highest, and he's going to have the, David's throne, an everlasting throne. She's got to be pretty concerned at this point of what the angel is speaking about. The angel goes on, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, for how long? Forever. Now, if this was going to be an earthly child, he can't reign over the house of Jacob forever. Just for a lifetime. And of his kingdom, there will be what? No end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? That's a good response. Earthly response. A human response. Mary's not a scientist, but I'm sure she figured out how you have babies. And she's wondering, how is this going to happen? I mean, I'm hearing you. I'm listening. I'm paying attention. But uh, how is that going to happen? Excuse me? And the angel answered her. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. This is the most radical statement in the entire Bible. He will be called the Son of God. 
Radical statement. This statement changes the whole Bible. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God, what? Nothing is impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Angel shows up at a time in her life where she has a plan. Have you ever had a time in your life where you had a plan and God showed up and changed the plan? She had a plan. But God had a plan. And God's plan never fails. She had a plan, but God had a plan. God showed up. And God said, listen, carefully, Mary, because you are going to bear the child of God Almighty. You're going to bear God's child. Now, why didn't Jesus just like, you know, fly down out of the sky like Superman, land on a tall building and say, here I am, the Savior of the world. Why, did, why didn't he just appear? Why did he have to be born of Mary? Why did Jesus have to be born of Mary? Why did God Almighty, now think about this, it's God Almighty, not some mighty, not partial mighty, God Almighty, why does God Almighty put his seed in a human body? Because you couldn't go to heaven if God didn't do that. What do you mean? It's the key to why we're sitting in church today. The Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. But the Bible also says that Jesus is the Son of Man. He's the Son of Man, but he's the Son of God. Jesus has to be the Son of Man, and Jesus has to be the Son of God. He can't be one or the other. He has to be both. And why does Jesus have to be both? I'll make it very clear. Man, kind, has sin. You have sin. I have sinned. Every human that's ever walked this earth has sinned. Every one. And if you want to sit there and believe that you don't have sin, wow. Where do you come from? Everyone has sin. It starts when you're a baby. Young kids have sin. If you don't believe me, have one. You'll find out real soon what cute sinners they are. Everyone has sin. Therefore, G Jesus could not be born of Mary through a, a, a man because if he was born of a man, then he would have sin. Because the Bible says that the sins are passed down through the Father. Not that women don't have sin because your father's sin was passed down into you women. So every person has sin. But the sin is passed down through the Father. That's the way God designed it. Why did God design it that way? Because God had a plan. God had a perfect plan. Now, if the sin is passed down through the Father, then Jesus can't have an earthly father. Why can't he have an earthly father? Because if Jesus is going to die for my filthy sin, Jesus can't have sin. If he's going to be my sacrifice... He has to be sinless. Why? Because if he has sin, then he needs to be punished for his sin just like I have to be punished for my sin. So we need to find a human without sin who doesn't deserve to be punished so that he can be punished for me. Are you getting that? Now, so God in his infinite wisdom, God himself 
becomes human. He's in Mary. He starts out as a little tiny conception. Little tiny thing that could fit on the top of a pin needle. He starts out in the, in the world right there. Right there. Little microscopic Jesus. Right there. He begins to grow in our world. Sinless. Sinless. And he grows and he grows and he grows. You know what's so cool about this? Is Jesus is born in this world. And we'll get to that as we continue the Christmas story. Jesus is born into this world 100% man and 100% God. Why does he have to be 100% man? So that he could be a human sacrifice. Why does he have to be 100% God? So he can be a human sacrifice without sin. Is the, is the Mary story starting to make sense? How God designed this whole plan? So God Almighty, and, and think about this, God Almighty created the heavens and the earth and all that's in it. God Almighty becomes the creation for the creation. What a plan. And God didn't just come up with this plan through the process of our delinquency. This plan was forged before the foundation of the earth. God knew we'd fail. How did God know we would fail? Because God's eternal. What does that mean? God was at the end when, he, when we were at the beginning. See, he's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He's, he's, he was there before the earth. And he's there long after we're gone. That's why I have comfort in knowing the Lord because he is to where tomorrow is before I got there. Oh, what am I going to do, Lord? Oh, that's right. You got this. <laughs> that's right. You got this. Wow. God had a plan. Before the foundation of the earth, he had a plan. And the plan was... To die for you. To die for you. For you and for me. Do you know that God would have died for you even if you were the only person on the earth? Why? He loves his creation. The Bible said he wishes that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. What does it mean God wishes that none would perish? That there isn't one single person that's going to hell that God wanted to go to hell. It's not his desire. Going to hell is the consequence of not believing. That's, that's what hell is all about. And God gives every human that's ever lived on this earth an opportunity to go to heaven. He wishes that none would perish. But all would recognize this incredible, incredible gift of his sacrifice. What do you mean his sacrifice? Think about it. God has lived for eternity. How long is eternity? You can't explain it. Eternity. Eternity isn't some scope of time. It's not some clock that never stops winding. Eternity is the existence of existence. Never ending. And never had a beginning. So here is God in eternity. And now he's stuck inside of a woman's stomach. Growing, developing. Boop, boop, boop. Whoa, okay, this is really different. Uh, never did this before. He never did that before. Okay, it's time to come out. Oh, no. Boom. Well, I never did that before. God is experiencing life as you know it and I know it. Isn't that so cool? Then he had to go to school, and then he had to do chores, and then he had to clean up after the animals. He had to carry the hay. He had to, you know, he had to live a life on this earth. And he's God. He should be worshipped and adored. 
We should be flocking to him and spoiling him rotten. And yet he's living a life that you live and I live. Why? So the genuine sacrifice could truly identify with who he's dying for. Fully identify. You know, it says that Christ was tempted in all ways. And it caused him to be able to sympathize with our weakness. What is your weakness? We all have weaknesses. Everyone's got a weakness. Guess what? God lived this life so that he can identify and sympathize with your weakness. He says he was tempted in all ways. Always. But without sin. So God comes to Mary, highly favored one. Blessed are you among women. Now, I believe that Mary is called blessed among all women for several reasons. One, because she's the the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty in the flesh. But number two is because she said, bring it on. Let it be according to your word. She's blessed among all women because she had no resistance to this calling at all. You ever ask someone in church if they'd like to do something for the church? And what's their response? I need to pray about that. You know what that means? No. (laughs) If they say I need to pray about that, that means I don't want to do it. But her response wasn't, you know, Angel, let me go to the temple and pray about this. Uh, This is a big decision. And I need to talk to Joseph about it. We need to work this out because he's not going to be too happy about this situation here. Uh, She didn't get into all that. She just said, let it be according to your word. Hallelujah. Let it be according to your word. Blessed among women. So I think she is blessed among women. Now, um, there's this big to-do about Mary, the mother of Jesus, Uh, Some churches uh, put her on a throne with Jesus, which is wrong. And some churches don't even want to talk about her, which is wrong. If the Bible says she's blessed among all women, then she is. I can't wait to meet her in heaven. I think it's going to be pretty cool. Mary, you are awesome. But Jesus is more awesome. Let let, Let it be what it is. She's blessed among all women. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, as Jesus gets older, we don't see anything about his father any longer. There's lots of speculation, but I don't think the Bible deserves speculation. We just don't know what happened to Joseph. But we do do know what happened to Jesus. He grew. He grew. And then he stepped out into his ministry to declare to the world, I am the son of the living God. I am the Messiah. I am your rescuer. I will die for your sin. And on the third day, I will rise again. And Jesus declared, no man will take my life. I will lay it down. And that which I lay down, I will rise up again. And Jesus went to the cross to die for my sin. The Bible says that he was beaten beyond recognition. Spikes were driven through his hands and feet to nail him to a cross of wood, the very tree that he created, he was nailed to. The description of crucifixion is so gruesome and so horrible. I just won't get into it today. But it is probably one of the most horrible deaths you can die. And he did that for me. So when Mary was greeted by the angel and, say, and, and told what the situation is going to be. And as God Almighty places himself inside of Mary. He came to live for one reason. To die for you. He came to live to die for you. 
Now, one of the most beautiful things about Mary is she was the very first living sanctuary. She was the very first human tabernacle. God dwelled within her. And through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you became a living tabernacle. God lives inside of you. That's why the scripture says, do you not know you're not, that you're not your own? You've been bought with a price? That you're the temple of God. You are the temple of God. Why? God lives inside of you. And Mary was the first temple of God, living temple of God. It's a beautiful story, a glorious story. But I'd like to take you to a song that Mary sung after the angel left. A song that she sang when she realized what has just happened. And here is Mary's song. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. I want to stop there. Because as an evangelical believer, um, I will not resist calling Mary blessed. I'm not one of these uh, Christians that are paranoid about Mary. And I know that Mary has gotten a bad rap on earth. Some religions put her on a pedestal. They even pray to her. Some religions consider her almost equal to Jesus. But on the, on the other hand, some religions completely ignore her totally. Just think of what a servant she is. Blessed among all women. She even declares, they will, every generation will call me blessed. Well, they should. We won't put her on a pedestal and we won't ignore her. And I look forward to meeting her. Verse 49 says, For he who is mighty has done great things for me. She's not complaining about her wedding getting ruined. She's fired up. When God changes your plans, get excited. Get excited. She declares that the holy and holy is his name. Holy is his name. There's no other name on earth where man must be saved but the name Jesus Christ. Verse 50 says, His mercy is on those who fear him and from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their heart. I love that verse. He has put down the mighty from their throne and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers and to Abraham and his seed forever. Mary is worshiping God. Mary is putting this whole thing that has just happened to her into full perspective. And she's recalling the promise that has been spoke of to Abraham before there was any Israelites that God will send the Messiah. And he did. And Jesus is just as much alive today as he was then. And he's just as much in the business of saving lives as he was then. And Jesus is really paying attention to your life every detail of your life. Jesus has watched you since your conception. He's paid attention to every breath you've ever taken. 
He's been aware of every thought you've ever thought. And he's followed you around your whole life for one specific reason, to bring you to heaven someday. But you can't get there without him. So what does he do? He gets you to come to Club Zion so he can plead with you to turn to him and accept him into your life. He loves you. And he'll never stop loving you. He loves you. And he wants to take you to heaven. But he declares there's only one way. Jesus said himself with his own words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man will come to the Father. No woman will come to the Father except through me. He came to die for you, to die for your sin, because sin can't enter heaven. And if you're figuring on some other way to get to heaven without getting rid of the sin, good luck. It's not going to happen. Sin can't go to heaven. There's only one way that sin can be removed, and that way is that God Almighty himself had to come and be a human to die for your sin. That's the only way out. And in believing that, it says you have eternal life. So today you make a decision. You make a decision today. Your way or his way. Your way or his way. God wishes that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. The word repentance means change your mind. What are you changing your mind away about? Your way or his way? Change your mind. Is it going to be his way or your way? Your way leads to destruction. His way leads to life. You make the choice. He allowed you to make the choice. That way he doesn't have to get in trouble when you go to hell. Because he doesn't send anyone to hell. They send themselves to hell by not making the choice. So he offers the choice. He's off the hook. You're on the hook. You're going down. I hate to put it in such a terrible way, but it's going to be worse than what I explained. God wants to save your soul. And he sent his son into the world for you. So as we prepare for communion this morning, I want you to be aware of the work that was done on the cross for you. Now, communion is for the believer. It's not for the unbeliever. It says uh, in, in Corinthians that um, on, the last, on the night before Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. And he gave thanks and he said, take, eat. This is my body. It's broken for you. And then he said, in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he says this, if anyone eats or drinks this in an unworthy manner, will be guilty. You're in trouble. What is the unworthy manner? Taking communion if you never surrendered to Jesus Christ and you're not a Christian. If you're not a believer and you take communion, communion, that's the unworthy manner. So that's, I just want to help you out, not get in trouble with God. If you're not a believer, you're not surrendered to Jesus, let the communion pass today. If you have committed your life to Christ, take communion with us, join with us as we break bread. Um, you might be thinking, oh, no, what do I do now? If I don't take communion, then they'll know I'm not saved. And, uh, you know, don't start wrestling in your mind about weird stuff. Just get saved now and take communion. Just settle it. Yeah, Lord, I, I accept you into my life. I ask you to take away my sin. I believe everything you've taught me, Lord. I, I'm, I'm all in. I surrender my life to you, and you take communion. You're, you're in there. You don't have to worry about play that head game with yourself. I don't know if I should take communion. Ah, should I? Be saved. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today, not tomorrow, today. Well, but the, that person next to me thinks I'm not saved or thinks I'm saved or maybe what will they think if I take communion? Forget about the person next to you. They, they probably won't even ever see him again after you leave this earth. And if you've got to worry about them, they might need to get saved. 
So just get saved, take communion with us, enjoy the communion, and let's pray. Father, we thank you, bless you, we give you glory and honor and praise. Lord, you're a good God. You're a perfect God, a loving God, and we need you. Lord, uh, I just pray for anyone in the service today who has been moved to, uh, to really turn to you, to make it right, to settle it, Lord. I pray that you would uh, help them to, to uh, draw near to you and confess who they are openly to you, that you'd save them and ref- refresh their hearts, fill them with the Holy Spirit, remove their sin, and bring them into the family. And Lord, uh, we thank you for this message. We thank you for the story that you prefer, preserved for thousands of years so that we can enjoy it today. And hear our praise, Lord, as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.